to the oh, we're funneling money to people who are collecting unearned income for the extraction of our resources. And so the incentives are all wrong. Their incentives, of course, are our incentives, uh, all of us, are is to compete and fight over access to those resources because whoever do, owns them gets the value. And then likewise, so they're getting free money for extracting our resources. The banks are getting free credit for issuing uh, the money as debt. And both of them are collecting unearned income. And so the people who are entrepreneurs, the business people and the workers are getting shafted. We're having to pay every single transaction uh, part of our transaction goes to pay uh, for the income for to these owners. You know, think of Norway, Saudi Arabia, uh, et cetera, and America for the oil, for the trees, for the fish, um, and likewise for the banks for their interest. That's embedded in every product that we buy. Every corporation has debt, uh, and so that in infiltrates our entire system. Anyway, so in creditism, all we're saying is, look. You know, we have modern digital tools now that handles the issues of trust that we didn't have before. You could never trust humans because if you keep records, records can be destroyed. Um, and so anyway, so that's the, the, the general um, macro of it is that we would distribute the money directly to everyone as a UBI and then simply distribute the money uh, when it's earned. So anytime somebody learns, plays or works, they would collect the credit. Uh, just like in a sports game, when the team scores a point, we give them a point. It doesn't come from anyone else. We don't take it from somebody to give it to them. We just give it to them. So same thing here. So when you do something valuable, you would get more credit. Uh, and so it, it's a fundamental shift in the, uh, not just in the monetary system, but in the economics, because we're fundamentally changing the ownership of capital. We're, we're, we're reclaiming all of the common resources of the world, not just the resources, but the common assets, things like trains, uh, you know, uh, companies, uh, these things should never have been privately owned. They can be, uh, you know, stewarded by a group of people, the workers, but they should not be uh, collecting value for something that they're not even involved in. Anyway, so that's it in a nutshell. Thank you. Would you mind putting your contact information in the chat? Because I think there are a few people that would probably want to reach out to you. And I'm going to step back and let our check-in continue the way it usually does. And I see we have somebody else here, slow, that's, I think, new to our call, but I did see him on our list. I'm new, too, so I'm not really sure what check-in means. Um, so check I apologize if I intruded and did something I wasn't supposed to. You didn't. And no. I'm new to having this function. Okay. <laughs> so uh, Jerry's not here for this call. This is our check-in call where we speak when we feel moved to just check in about what's going on. Um, I broke protocol. I asked Ramsey to introduce himself. If you feel called, you can do the same. If I could say, Stacy, the other thing about check-in is that it's not a back and forth. Each person speaks their own piece, not responding to the things that came before. Uh, we keep the chat quiet during check-in. Yes, thank you. Well, I'll check in on just a, a, a thing we are doing. We've we figured out a way to access uh, neighborhood focused Biden climate money using our uh, our CATACAT platform, our philanthropic investment platform, because you can't get the climate money because it's reimbursement. So it's stuff for like solar and geothermal. But we're going to do kind of a GoFundMe, except the money comes back to the either the donor or to the nonprofit in the middle. That seems to be the, the, the more uh, what people are doing more of that they give like hundred dollars. And then when it pays back, it pays to them. And so they've actually given $200. And so we, we can do that at the amounts that uh, reimbursement is for both of those things for this really cool community center that's been in a, an urban uh, food forest for a while. So it's, it, uh, I'm, I'm also going to be talking to the energy department folks that are going to do this and
and find out how else people are solving the reimbursement problem. It's like all this stuff that's out there, but you just can't get it. It's like a CDFI. It's just, it's like your uncle Edgar's car that's up on blocks. You know, it runs great, but it doesn't really run. <clears throat> and the climate money works, but you can't get it. And so anyway, we found a way to unlock a couple pockets of it. So it's, it's kind of cool. <laughs> you need somebody who has a, the social capital to do a small donor campaign of folks that have already given to them. And then those donors will either get the money back to give with again, or they'll just give it to the nonprofit they care about, and they'll have given twice as much as they gave. So anyway, we got that working. Should be up in a couple of weeks. When I say up, it's this online marketplace, Catacap. I'll put a link when we're doing links, but not now. Thank you. And just to remind you, you can just jump in when you're ready. Doug, you're muted if you're talking to us. You're talking to somebody else. I'll go. I'm uh, uh, feeling a bit raw, I guess. I've been. Um, Pretty withdrawn for a while, uh, uh, which is uh, I've been through a lot, many, many cycles of that. Uh, uh, I live at a. My name is also John Abbey. Some people may know, uh, as well as, but I've been going by slow for a few years, which is uh, ironically, given how withdrawn and and kind of paralyzed I get. Sometimes it literally means speed up. It's like when you're not moving at all, slow is actually faster than that. Like do something, at least move slowly. Uh, and at other times it's a reminder to, you know, slow down and uh, check things twice and so on. Uh, look where I'm going. Um, um, I live at a housing cooperative, Walnut Street Co-op in Eugene, Oregon. Um, I have very diverse interests. Uh, a long time ago, I my first exposure to activism ended with a lot of clarity about a lot of messed up dynamics in activism. And, uh, uh, you know, my life since then has just sort of been a continuing expansion of my understanding of, of the mess we're in and what needs to be done about it. I, I come at it from a very systems perspective. I love Danella Meadows stuff. And uh, I live here with Tom Atley of the Co-Intelligence Institute, which has been a great source of you know, both uh, connections with interesting people and, and uh, great ideas and stuff. Um, at the co-op, one, one nice thing that's happened over time is there's a guy who moved here who had done his undergraduate thesis on uh, temporary communities in, among homeless people uh, and had really made some uh, great observations about uh, how successful, you know, the self-organizing was, how little extra effort it took, you know, to get them to be functional and some of the politics that happens around them. So all of that, he moved, he, he and his partner moved in here just before Occupy happened. <laughs> so that, you know, a lot of energy around that, they ended up starting a nonprofit called Square One Villages, which has gotten the state of Oregon to pass a law, uh, giving property tax exemptions, um, um, to uh, low-income housing, uh, so we're 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 a weird kind of co-op. We're we're converting ourselves into a limited equity co-op to fit this law. Um, so I don't know. Living here has given me an appreciation for like some of the long cycles that happen. Like you do things, you invest in things you don't even know are going to come back and benefit you later. Um, so it's given me real-world experience and stuff I kind of knew, you know, from reading and so on. Um, 
so yeah, I, I don't have like a project that's like my mission to do in the world, but I hang around with a lot of people who do, and I'll join in with anything that seems promising, you know, so Pete Kaminsky, you know, uh, I got in touch with him a while ago and have been uh, joining sometimes in the massive wiki work. Um, there's this summit happening this weekend, uh, uh, which I'll drop a link if nobody knows about uh, co-creating a world that works for all that looks promising. Um, you know, I consider the co-op itself, you know, a small but significant uh, thing and con and contributing to others in the area wanting to form co-ops. Um, our house went through a really massive, uh, multiple people involved, you know, uh, harms, accusations, violence, uh, and so on. Several people moved out. Um, the person most affected, actually, their main request, you know, was not punishment or something for somebody their main request was for the house to get you know step up our capacity for conflict resolution and accountability and it's had that effect we have a team that we didn't have before we've done a lot more reading and sharing so for me that's an incredibly significant silver lining when this house started it was uh, started by a bunch of people who had taken a, a dynamic facilitation class together uh, that's the process started by Jim Ruff, if if you're aware of that, or Ro uh, Rosa Zubizarreta uh, has also done a ton of work um, um, to help make that accessible to more people. And so the first bunch of people who lived here were very process aware, you know, including uh, 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 Kavana Tree Bresson, uh, who's a really fantastic process person. Um, uh, she has a website, uh, treegroup.info. I guess it probably forwards to something else now. Anyway, whatever. Great, great resource for facilitation and process stuff. But it, but that kind of dwindled over time. And uh, this feels like a resurgence of like, okay, if we, if, if for, I always feel a lot more hopeful in any group I'm involved in if there's a, a capacity to kind of as, as go meta, you know, look at what we're doing and how we're doing it. Um, uh, and so that's that's definitely a silver lining for me of having gone through all this is there's genuine interest, you know, from a lot of people in the house to get into that kind of stuff, mediation, facilitation and so on. Um, yeah, I, I for me, that's like another way of saying I, I consider myself more of a process activist than a issue activist. Um, and, you know, and a lot of people are all excited about this poly crisis, meta crisis uh, narrative and so on for uh, uh, for me i'm honestly i've read a bunch i've listened to a bunch i'm not seeing anything new like i feel like i've heard and seen all those same things for a long time i mean there it's not there's nothing at all new but like the big picture i i feel like has been you know being laid out for us ever since the limits to growth you know people and and stuff um uh we've just kind of become aware of more specifics so i for me i take I know some people have responded to all that. Oh, wow. Oh, it's so awful and despairing. I actually feel more hopeful because if more people are aware of it at that level and talking about it, then maybe we'll actually uh, do something more proactive rather than waiting uh, for the worst crashes before shifting things. Thank um, you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for stopping me. <laughs> Check. Can I speak? We usually try to just let everybody check in first. Um, can we, can I, you know, I, Doug had brought this up last time about having too much space in between. And I kind of agree. And so since I'm in charge today, <laughs> Jerry is the word boss. Can you raise your hand if you have a check in that you want to make that you, that, and if not, Maybe we can move into a conversational thing. Is there anybody here that wants to check in? Can you just raise your hand? 
Okay, so then I'm making an executive decision. Renzi, speak. Um, I was just going to say, um, in listening to John speak, you know, um, I'm actually hopeful and positive myself, but in doing the research and reading the history, we, you find that <clears throat> these kinds of things ebb and flow. The, the things that we're grappling with now, I feel like they were doing, they were grappling with the exact same issues about a hundred years ago. And so they had a lot of, of, of new economic ideas and new uh, movements, uh, new political developments, wars, uh, all in that you know, short period of time in the early 1900s in that first half of that century. And I feel like we're repeating that now. The only um, narrative difference that I see between then and now that gives me more hope is that the, the world of hierarchy and domination and, and, and you know, ruling one uh, over the other, uh, the game A, right, of, of, of rivalrous competition um, is seemingly unstoppable, is seemingly unchangeable. And so the people who have hope of changing it to, to something that isn't rivalrous, that is, a, you know, maybe competitive, a cooperative, and fair, um, are at a disadvantage. But in modern times, I feel like that the game of of that rivalrous game is is threatening all of humanity, and so that presents a narrative and an opportunity for for change to actually finally happen. It could, you know, because it feels like this time we actually have to change, not because we want to socially, you know. Um, uh, to live with one another, but because of what we're doing to the environment. And so I feel like the impetus for change um, is going to draw in more people than, than the movements that did 100 years ago. So I, I feel like there will be, I'm hoping that there will be enlightened, uh, you know, even rich people who, um, who see the light, who recognize that, you know, they would prefer a world of security and safety uh, and prosperity for their children rather than one of a uh, uh, of the opposite of, of what we have now. And so I'm hopeful for that reason only, but I don't, I'm not hopeful because of human history is, is, you know, is filled with uh, bad stuff because of rivalry. But I think we're at the precipice and I hope we can change. Thank you. Um, Ken and Jose are here and I see Carl here. So this is sort of a check-in that went off the rails because Jerry, Put the, put the hosting over to me. Um, so nobody else wanted to check in, but if the three of you do, please go before me and then I'll do my check-in. Uh, Ken, Jose, you're interested. Oh, Klaus also has his hand up. Uh, yeah, I'm, uh, uh, okay. Go ahead, Carl. I was... Uh, I was just um, glad to be able to attend. I've been um, in a course that's been on Thursdays. Uh, still, still, um, we'll be working on things for the next couple of weeks, but I want to uh, uh, stop in. I, the, um, I mentioned it in the chat last week that it's on the uh, it's the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching, and they've developed this whole improvement science process. So. Um, um, look, I got a small group, uh, including um, Doug Breitbart, who's a regular on here too, that uh, we're um, working towards a, a workshop that'll be um, the 20th of July. So that's kind of where I'm now. Good to see everyone. Thank you. Klaus? Yeah, sort of a semi check in violating the rules of uh, conversation. But uh, what Ramsey uh, was just talking about sort of resonates with my my uh, focus and concerns also. <laughs> when you, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get, you know, enough uh, people to understand, particularly focused on, you know, agriculture and environmental uh, degradation caused by our food system, which is dominating the environment. Right? I mean, here in the high desert where I live in Bend, 80% of our water is used for agriculture. And that's true for an, on the national level, 70%. But uh, there are there are quite a few pockets where it's 80 plus percent. So 
So you, the active culture is the elephant in the room, and it dominates you know, so much of of the economy. Um, that and, and and for some reason, people are just not really cognizant of that. It's very difficult to to convey uh, the incredible impact this all this all has. So the question then is, how do you get people? To participate and understand and and modify and change you know, their behavior, and so many experiments have have taken place of changing uh, society, right? Of getting and um, making it more benign, uh, taking the edge out of uh, authority and and power, um, and nothing seems to work. And when you when you think about uh, our history, right, the evolutionary path of of humanity. Um, as far back as you look, it has been dominated by strife and competition. I mean, you can go back to Plato and uh, uh, Shakespeare. I mean, you can go through the entire you know, history of mankind, and it's about competition and strife and and uh, fighting with each other. And then, the, the, on the other hand, any science fiction writer you read looking forward, can't envision a future that is any different, right? I have uh, I have you know, barely seen uh, a science fiction book, and I was an avid science fiction reader, that would uh, consider a you know, peaceful, uh, benign society. It's all the same moving, moving into the future. So the question is, how do you tame these instincts in, in, in this... Uh, this elbow elbowing you know, uh, into advantage uh, that individuals uh, engage in, um, because our collective future is really at risk in ways that it has never been before. This is really a breaking point, you know, it's an inflection point in in our past, in this in our evolutionary past. So, um, I mean, I'm my my uh, hope is that you can use AI uh, to to elevate the argumentations to the point where they pray, where they cut through, you know, but in nice ways. I mean, in ways that are constructive, um, and so and, uh, and by by providing you know uh, opportunities of hope, right by providing uh, opportunities for for engagement in ways that are community based community driven constructive uh neighborly uh and all those things that people basically want but uh there are not really very good camp mechanisms to make all that happen um now which is why this is such an incredibly crazy uh, uh time right now to 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 see which fork we're going forward with, you know, are we going uh, with uh, this Republican vision uh, of more central authority that doesn't really have a plan other than wanting to have authority, and then going forward or going forward with you know, the a, a more democratic model, um, but that is still shredded in competition and refusal to go along, and so there is a common vision missing. Right. And and uh, and how to get uh, how to get us into into a uh, an understanding of uh, what's happening in nature, where you don't have to uh, where you don't get shouted down when you uh, mention the word climate change or anything. There is a, a raging conversation right now in citizen climate lobby. You know, someone released a film. Uh, uh, that is basically about climate change is not happening and it's all nonsense. Uh, and and uh, how do you how do you cope and deal with something like this? You know, so the 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 insistence uh, of uh, people who have who are controlling uh, uh, the the majority of assets and so on on maintaining status quo is just overwhelming. Um, so anyway, the, my so I'm I'm you now working with several groups. We have a great conversation right now in the Sierra Club. I'm on the national uh, grassroots network team. I'm, the, I'm in the leadership team there. So we have uh, the, um, uh, really uh, engaged discussions that are really new uh, in in their intensity to try to align you know, these many opinions where. Uh, you you have the, the anti-grazing team and the water sentinels and the 
food and act team and a cavo team and so you know, all splintered into oftentimes contradicting each other and so on so 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 to create alignment you know is story bound you, you have to have a story that everybody can can sign up for it has to be a simple story you now and uh a simple story that 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 resonates across the spiral you now uh and and connects to the emotion and and has people has people uh, uh, uh go along with so that's that's um that's what I'm you know, struggling with and and, uh, and and engage with. Thank you. Um, thank you for breaking the rules a little. I just I just want to say that I think that the 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 intersection between check-ins and conversation is really the sweet spot, provided that everybody you know coming into the call gets to check in first, and nobody comes here with something burning. I think that's what we really do want to find is where the check-ins and the conversation meet. And just I want to just remind everybody to, you know, just watch our time so that everybody gets to speak. And go ahead, Doug. Okay. Um, I have a line of thought that uh, has several pieces to it. So forbear with me. Uh, it starts with the observation that most people are in the view that climate change should actually lead to new economic activities that they could benefit from. Uh, that's probably just metaphorically speaking, 80% of the population. The other 20% thinks we've got to slow down and stop in order to get any control over the environment. Uh, given the polarization between those two, it's very hard for anything positive to happen. So my thinking has gone that the nation state is too small an entity to be able to move the whole system. And the corporations are worse. Uh, they're all, both bounded and boundaries make it very hard for local activity to move across boundaries. So I've been thinking uh, for quite a while now that uh, the nation state is one level of a big organization, but cultures and civilizations are another level that's actually quite bigger. And maybe the future really requires that we move into the cultural level. And so my thinking has gone, if you look at the possible candidates uh, of what a bigger culture could be, they probably involve elements of religion. That's been the history of humanity. And uh, uh, maybe just given the way things are, that Buddhism, which actually kind of got absorbed by in the US, most people in the 60s and the reaction to the 60s, uh, is a kind of percolating like mushrooms under the ground as a way of thinking and feeling. That is, you want to avoid pain, stay modest, and be loving. And that Buddhism uh, leading a religious revival might be the kind of reaction that will be provoked by the kind of chaos that we're going to go into. Uh, I can make all the parts of that argument more explicit and larger, but I think you can see where I'm going with it. So thanks. Oh, I wanna add one thing. Uh, this last week, I was at a conference here in Malaysia, where I'm living, uh, of mostly uh, Sayan and Chinese and Malaysian uh, politicians talking about climate change. And what was so striking is how deeply they have, have absorbed the logic that you've got to grow in order to be green. There's no awareness of the contradiction in those attitudes. And that's really striking to me. Uh, other than that, they're uh, kind of kindly passive people. I was really struck by the Chinese who seemed much more like the rest of the Asians than I expected. Uh, but there's no expressed feeling of urgency. So end of thought.
Hi, all. Uh, Stacy, I wonder, uh, since we're betwixt and between uh, check-in and conversation, uh, shall we use the chat yet or not? And post links or not? <laughs> you do you. <laughs> Um, it's a it's a collective decision, right? We've decided not to use chat during check-ins because we can end up in multiple conversations at once, and then we're not paying attention to each other. I'm not using it. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, I I uh, I would write, like to reflect that I'm uncomfortable uh, betwixt and between. I I'd, I'd rather be doing check-ins or conversation um, and not somewhere in the middle. Um, I also acknowledge that. Uh, being in a liminal space is generative and interesting. And, you know, uh, even if I'm uncomfortable, I enjoy uh, generative spaces. So, um, so I don't know what the heck we're doing here. Uh, I'm going to rattle off a bunch of things that, I, I, that are top of mind, which is kind of a check-in, but it's also a little bit of a conversation. So I guess that's where we are, uh, which I'm totally cool with. Um, uh, Ramsey, maybe not right now, or maybe now, I don't know. Um, um, I'm, I, I love your passion and enthusiasm, and I, I'm interested to hear how credit, your, your ideas around creditism are different than uh, alternative currencies or local exchange trading systems. Um, and, and actually, I, I think I, I know a fair bit about um, uh, mutualism, creditism-ish kinds of things, uh, commercialism, uh, capitalism. Um, and especially alternative currency kinds of things. I, I know a few other folks here are, are probably more expert than I um, uh, about like fancy finance systems. Um, another thing that kind of comes up, I, I think when Ramsey talks about creditism is, um, uh, and, and it was interesting hearing, hearing you say, um, uh, maybe this time around, we've got more people interested. Um, I, I have, uh, a real problem with that idea. I don't think anybody's interested, you know, like, like percentage-wise uh, in the poly crisis. Um, I think it's very few people who are, and I don't think that's different from 100 years ago. I, not, not to argue, but um, the the thing that makes me uh, that gives me hope or or uh, optimism uh, is that we've got tools now that we didn't have 100 years ago. Uh, we've got a, an incredibly large world and a large population, and 100 years ago, uh, moving information around that world was very, very, very slow. Um, now we've got uh, like, like incredibly significant tools for decentralizing, um, uh, but still coordinating. Uh, so it's pretty clear. I, I think over you know over the course of a couple of years, uh, the um, uh, the the think. To use an old slogan, think lo uh, think think globally, act locally. It, it's becoming crisper and clearer to me. Um, it's really important when I see the people that I think are being effective. They're doing something locally to them, uh, where they've got enough leverage to actually get stuff done. Um, but then we also know um, over the course of the past, you know, two, three, five, ten, twenty years, uh, the the things like telecommunications and information. <clears throat> um, information dissemination techniques that we can use now um, are also really important. You know, I'm, hey, I'm solving this problem here. And, and you know, is there somebody with a similar problem someplace else in the world? Um, and maybe it's similar because of the climate, maybe it's similar because of the people, maybe it's similar because of, you know, we have a lot of ways that we coordinate, that we can coordinate. Where we're, I think the, the thing that maybe frustrates me about that, and I'm sure frustrates a lot of the decentralization people, is it's like we have so many tools and we're so good with them if we want to use them, but we don't, we haven't gotten to yet. Um, most of the world still lives in kind of a broadcast, you know, uh, awareness mode, um, and we don't have, uh, you know, we don't have good discovery mechanisms, we don't have good um, coordination mechanisms, not because the technology isn't there, but just because we haven't realized that we could use them uh, for good. Um, I'm super hopeful, though. I, I feel really good that it's getting better and better and better. I can look back over the past couple of years. Massive Wiki, of course, is a kind of a decentralization technology. Um, I feel a lot better about where it's situated now um, and what it can do. And, and I am also getting more realistic about what it can't do. So um, I'm super happy about all that. 
Um, one of the, the, the thing that struck me most uh, about polycrisis today, uh, this week, uh, came from Ken or Hank, and I'm not sure which one. <laughs> I think it's Ken. Um, there's a, an essay called Prefixing the World, uh, Prefixing the World. Um, uh, the, and I'll put a link soon. Um, the guy who wrote it said, why the polycrisis is a permacrisis, which is actually a metacrisis, which is not really a crisis at all. Um, so we can get distracted by this new polycrisis thing. It's like, you know, uh, we've, for th tens of thousands of years, we've had to like stumble through and make, make the world better. And so, you know, uh, it, it's cool that we're thinking about it and it's, you know, it's also something that we've been doing for a long time. Um, I, I, uh, so in, in my, uh, in my cosmology, uh, we do, don't often take, uh, take stock of the fact that there are things called what I call hyperscale, hyperscale social structures. Um, it's really easy for individual people to think that we can change things with individuals or groups of individuals. My deal is that uh, uh, super scale, uh, hyperscale social structures like capitalism or religion or feudalism or things like that um, are, are golems that live on top of millions of people or billions of people. And that, you know, as much as you run around and, and get your fellows to, to go, oh my God, there's a polycrisis or oh my God, there's not a crisis, but we need to work together or whatever. Um, if you're not applying levers to the, the structures which make something like the national politics in the U.S. happen, um, you know, national politics in the U.S. isn't run by Trump and Biden. It's not run by their machines. It's not run by the Democratic Party or the Republican Party. There's a whole like, like massive superstructure of how that works. And each of those people, we end up thinking as kind of like a rock band. It's like, oh my God, the band is the singer. You know, it's actually not just the singer. It's also the bass player and the guitar player and the drum player. And it's also a bunch of pro production people and it's a bunch of roadies and it's a bunch of, you know, music executives uh, screwing everybody over and all that kind of stuff, right? It's a whole structure of stuff. It's not the singer. It's not even the band. Uh, it's the band living in the context of all the music that's ever been created. Um, or all the music that's been created in Seattle, wherever they are. Um, so I, I, I love that people get excited and try to do stuff. Um, and unless we're disrupting these hyperscale social structures, um, you know, it's a waste of time. Uh, one of those odd things, and, and so the weird thing, I'm, I guess I'm teetering between how does a few people can control a hyperscale social structure? And you know, my, my base rule is that you can't, but obviously people are. And the people that I'm thinking of right now, when I look at the US and how contentious it is and how crazy both sides, the, the Democrat and the Republicans or the red and blue, however you wanna paint them, how close they are to each other and how far apart they think they are and how unwilling they are to work with the other side. And I think a lot of that is driven by external forces. Um, uh, countries or nation states or movements uh, from other parts of the world that said, hey, um, you know, the big nasty giant in my world uh, is Twitter um, and I want to take Twitter down. And so I think somebody literally kind of came up with the idea of taking Twitter down and effected it. Um, hey, uh, you know, the U.S. is, is too much of a warmongering state and it's super successful and it spends way too much money on beating up other people in the world, including me. If I just go make them crazy, if I just go make them fight each other, I don't have to have as much war on my soil. <laughs> and they have a lot more war on their soil. Even if the war doesn't look like um, uh, blood and gore, um, you know, we're, we're fighting, the US is fighting in a war and largely kind of losing, I think. Um, because we make crappy decisions about things. And I think we make crappy decisions because we can't coordinate. And I think a big chunk of why we can't coordinate is external forces. Um, uh, I'm also super excited about the thinking about book clubs uh, and the mailing list. Uh, I had a lot of fun with the Dawn of Everything mailing, uh, book club. Um, so I've got some ideas about um, doing more book club stuff. Um, and uh, I want to continue to be in that conversation with folks. Uh, so if you want to pull me aside, um, I've got some ideas. Um, thanks all. This was fun.
Gail, you know, if I could just jump in for a second, I want to clarify because I, I obviously wasn't clear. What I meant is that when one check-in is triggered by the next check-in and that becomes the conversation, I think that could really be a sweet spot. So if it's not just going on to, this is not related just to you. Thank you, Pete. This is not just for you, but, but I see that I wasn't clear. So when somebody checks in, if that triggers the next person for their own check-in, that kind of a, that's what I'm talking about. Because I could understand why you'd be uncomfortable having check-in and then conversation. What I'm talking about is sort of a natural connection between check-in and check-in and check-in. So I just wanted to clarify. Thank you, Gil, for waiting. Absolutely, Stacey. Um, I, I guess I'll go on record as saying I'm not liking the idea of the hybrid. Uh, but that said, I'm going to dive in to the hybrid. So, um, um, Pete, it was really interesting the 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 the, the, the arc of what you just shared because you started out talking about decentralization, then you wound up talking about hyperscale. So that was kind of funny. Um, I'm a decentralist from way back um, when I did uh, you know the the whole system planetary planning stuff with Bucky Fuller fifty some odd years ago. We came out consistently with decentralized solutions, uh, and Institute for Local Self Reliance came out of that work and so forth. But we're in a game of n dimensional chess, and we don't get to play at one level. We get to play at every level all the time. Um, um, you know, um, how to control hyperscale is a funny question. Um, the band, I like the band metaphor. The band is also the audience. Grateful Dead understood that really well. Um, um, and, um, you know, it goes to the question of you know, we, when we talk about changing minds, where minds are. Um, they're not, you know, they're not in this in this case in my head. They are somewhere more than that. So that's one of the things I've been, I think I've been trying, I, I think I've been focusing on four things lately. I keep on trying to get it down to one, but it's impossible. So four is maybe a, a good, relatively small number. Um, I'm thinking and working a lot about the in the realm of, of um, what should we call it? economic democracy, let's say, um, uh, employee-owned organizations. And you know that I've been working on um, um, uh, an economic institution to drive the transition to more employee ownership uh, and thinking a lot now, not just about cooperatives and trusts and so forth, but co-ops of co-ops, a portfolio of employee-owned companies where people not only own their company, but everything owns each other to build a kind of meta stability into the network. Um, I'm focusing a lot of my remunerative work on one-on-one -on -one coaching to help world changers be more effective at changing worlds, uh, doing that both live and that's the locus of my AI explorations is seeing what can be possible to make, uh, uh, uh build AI tools that help that happen. Um, and I'm uh, deep into the question of how minds change, which is a theme that a number of people have brought up here. Ken and I hosted what I, I thought was a really rich conversation last week on Living Between Worlds about how do minds and behaviors and cultures change. Um, the video went up yesterday. I'll post the link in the chat in a little bit. Um, and fourth, I'm trying, trying like hell to do more writing. Uh, and to get some of the writing that I've done out into the world. So I'm really interested in the neo books conversation, um, um, but hungry for tools uh, and allies to help me actually move some product uh, into existence there. And the one that feels the most pressing uh, and strategically probably the most dangerous for me, because it might kill my business, um, is a thing that I've been building on the structural defects of capitalism. Um, on the theory that uh, all of the many reform efforts that are underway around the world are uh, uh, are fundamentally weak because they are uh, they're, they're surface reforms. They're not dealing with structural issues that need to be addressed to shift where we're going. So that's sort of front of mind, um, but um, probably not very good for somebody who's typically earned his money from corporates. Um, um, couple of comments, um, class, you said something about science fiction, not having positive futures. My mind immediately goes to a ministry for the future, Star Trek and the dawn of everything, uh, as a few examples of many that hold out a vision of a different kind of world. 
Um, you, Klaus, you also said that it's time it's time to see which direction things will go. I think it's actually time to fight like hell. Um, I think locally means voting locally and organizing locally and getting out the vote. Uh, and there are a number of organizations that uh, make good use of people with their spare time to organize in other strategically significant districts like winning not just House seats, but state legislature seats because states control elections. So there's a lot of very astute strategic work on that focused over the next, what, five and a half months. Um, and yeah, Democrats and Republicans are similar in all kinds of ways. Uh, but if you think there's no difference between Trump and Biden, please read the Heritage Foundation 2025 plan, uh, which is awful explicit and awful terrifying. Um, and, um, you know, so we don't get to wait and watch and see what happens because um, November could dramatically change options that are available to all of us. Um, uh, and last but not least, uh, you know, there's a bunch of talk about hope. And I think about hope as not a wish and not a prediction, but as a stance, as a way to stand in the world and a way to live. Uh, and I go to, um, you know, Joanna Macy and Rebecca Solnit and Vaslav Havel and various others who talk about radical hope and active hope uh, and action with a commitment to a possibility in the world. And so, um, yeah. So uh, I'm really tired of wishful thinking <clears throat> from the progressive world of it would be nice if, and it would be good if, and we should, and a lot a lot of they should. And the world doesn't show up by people telling each other they should. There are other ways that it happened. And for me, part of the radical hope is that as difficult as change is, it happens, you know? And it's challenging to change, it's challenging for me to change my habits. And I've done so in my life sometimes. It's very challenging to change my wife's habits. It's really challenging to change the habits of, you know, slow the people in your co-op or the people in a corporation or the people in a nation. And yet it happens. So um, that's part of the place where I find my radical hope. And lastly, and I guess I'm, I'm being hybrid on the check-in, um, Doug, on the matter of, of, of uh, uh, religion and planetary structures, um, yeah, I, I, I feel what you're saying about Buddhism. Uh, I observe that the that the proselytizing religions and the proselytizing by conquest religions uh, have tended to do a better job of that. And that's a that's a, a koan built into the mix is how does gentle overtake aggressive um, parable of the tribes is a tremendous and challenging book on that subject. But I would particularly commend to you, if you haven't seen it, Roberto Mangabera Unger's book, The Religion of the Future, which very directly uh, walks into the questions that you're raising with great erudition and depth. So I'm complete. Thank you. I'm trying to figure out how to do my check-in because um, I'm also like, um, I'm, I'm also focused on process and Last week, a lot of our calls focused on the lack of diversity. And uh, in my personal life, in the different groups that I'm in, I've been constantly thinking, how do I get certain people together that I know don't connect exactly together, but I know their orbits need to connect. And it's, it's really difficult. I'm sorry, Gil? No, I just want to put my hand up when you're done. I want to say something else. Go ahead. And it's, it's, it's really difficult to juggle how to do that. And the only way that I can think is uh, initiating the conversations that bring the right people in the sp in, into, into proximity with each other and having those conversations be wide enough for different thoughts to come out so that people recognize it for themselves and then later connect. Um, that being said, real quick, I'll just hit on a few things. Klaus, um, what I do, you know, I have some MAGA people in my life and um, speaking to the polarization that Doug talked about, where I'm finding I'm able to make a connection is when I have climate deniers, those same climate deniers are also the people that are aware of, you know, the media and propaganda. 
So I bring up the questions of whether they know how much money has been put up with lobbyists and oil companies to convince them that there is no climate issues. So bringing those two things together changes the whole way in which they question. That's one example, but there's lots of things like that, that, you know, I'm interested in having those kinds of conversations. Where else could we find those places? Um, which would be good for all of us because, I mean, I know I have to constantly question what I believe. Um, what's the other thing I wanted to talk about? The A AI came up and book clubs came up. Pete, you last week you mentioned, and I totally agree with you, that you would love to hear more about what's going on for people personally. And while you were speaking, I was thinking, yeah, I feel the same. However, I'll be totally honest. I think there's a few people in this group that really don't feel the same. They really don't have that same curiosity. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but I'm saying that's just the truth. And I'm not about pretending to be curious when I'm not. I'd rather find what I'm really curious about and I'd rather other people find what they're really curious about and not for us to be pretending about it. What else is on my mind? Um, oh, Doug Carmichael, I need your full attention. <laughs> may, I, may I put you on the spot for a minute? I'm taking that as it. So, okay, and I'm only doing this because you, I am interested in power dynamics and things like that. And I think they're, they're really at the root of everything in our society. You posted a very short blog about Assange. And you said that, and I, the reason I'm calling upon you is you are somebody that has influence and status. You've spoken about it. You know, I'm just gonna put it out there. You know people. You said that you have never spoken about it. And the question I wanted to ask you and I really wanted you to go inside with this question. I mean, the arrest was over a decade ago and you said, I never said anything. And I'm just curious, what held you back from ever saying anything? Well, I'm not sure I know what held me back, uh, but I can try. I think the fact that uh, being critical of the arrest of Assange was such an outlier position uh, and I didn't understand the forces, and I didn't understand the rationale within the government for arresting him in the first place. So it led me to just be quiet. Now, I, I did speak in small groups and with friends, but uh, I think the situation called out for more, and I did not respond to it, and I feel bad about it. Thank you so much for sharing. I really want to thank you. I, I didn't want to ask it back on an email because I didn't want it to come out the wrong way. But I want to say for every one of us here, I think we need to have more conversations where we focus on like what holds us back. Because I know even in my life now, and again, those of you that know me, I'm outspoken. Every day I'm still, even in myself, I'm like, oh, I'm not saying this and I should be saying it and I know why I'm not saying it and I know it's not good. Somehow together we have to find a way to make it a little more comfortable to disagree, not even, I don't even wanna say disagree, to put forth other possibilities. Doug? Oh, Doug? Oh, 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 oh. Well, on the personal side, in 1968, I was arrested in Mexico for political activity and deported after four to eight hours of interrogation. Mm -hmm. uh, it may be a little spooky about the political process of the government. Wow. The way it happened is I was teaching at a university in Mexico, uh, University of the Americas. Uh, the president announced that the university was going to move to the town of Pueblo. And I didn't see that any of the students or faculty wanted to move. So I wrote an article about it. Uh, the article was in Excelsior, the Mexican main newspaper in Mexico City. 
when the contracts came out at the, towards the end of the year for the next year, I didn't get one, but I was a very popular teacher. So the student body government voted to pay my salary, at which point the president fired me, at which point the students closed the university down on strike, at which point the government sent in troops and arrested me. So uh, a lot of personal taste. And also, I was uh, at the Institute for Policy Studies when the Pentagon Papers were put together. And working in the basement with Xerox machines, putting that stuff together, when you knew that the government would be very uh, fretful about the release, uh, also had an impact on my perception. So I've learned to be, maybe it's the wrong view, but fairly cautious uh, in the realm of politics and power. Thank you. Mm. I just want to add one other thing. If we go back, and I forgot the percentage, I think it was 80% that Bernie Sanders said, 80% of the people that voted for Trump voted to break the system. And I just want to remind people that what Doug's speaking to is why many people voted uh, you know, for Trump in the first place, not because of him, but to break the system and to recognize that those feelings are underneath. I mean, at this point, there's enough people that know Trump is not the right guy, but just realize that there might be more in common with certain people that than we realize. I just wanted to say that. Oh, goodbye, Jose. I, I just wanted to name uh, what you were uh, speaking to, both you uh, as courage, uh, and I put it in the chat, but I, for me, it helps a lot to remember that the root is the, the French cœur, heart. Uh, so it's like, do we have the heart, you know, to, to take those risks? And it's important to be real about what the risks are. You know, I see people uh, uh, criticizing activists, you know, for covering their faces in public. And it's like, are people not aware of like all the things that have come down on activists like that? That is the kind of information, you know, that should be out there more. I mean, that's how nonviolence, that's part of how nonviolent action works, right? You do things that uh, threaten powers that be and they overreact. And then that creates, you know, more support for your cause. Um, um, but we do have to be really real what the risks are. Um, and, yeah, I don't know. It's it's a big deal to to step up, and I I mean the only way to build, you know, one's capacity around it is to have some positive experiences too. And I I was just reminded of one I had where I was fired from a job because I wore a a joke T shirt about the job to come and pick up my paycheck once, and uh, they kind of made fun of our our like a parody T shirt, and so the the boss fired me. And uh, I, I had the courage in the moment to just kind of let out all of everything I was seeing that was kind of, you know, not working well or whatever. And he was completely taken aback. Like it suddenly he realized I actually cared a lot. I was paying attention to a lot of things and I wanted it to be going better. And he rehired me. So, I mean, that's not always the response you get when you speak up. But, you know, if you keep doing it and you notice those moments, you know, where it does go in a good way. Uh, that can feed the, the capacity to do it, um, you know, but we absolutely need, you know, massive solidarity around this stuff. And you see it in the activist world, you know, people develop local uh, uh, bail funds, you know, everywhere, uh, just ready for whatever the next action is so that they can at least make, you know, the pain, minimize the pain that people face uh, when the system comes down on them. Um, but I, I, I think this courage thing is huge. And I think this is one of the huge benefits of working locally. People can work locally and build strong networks. I mean, you can build them, you know, translocal, you know, across as well is also good. You need both. But if you have a group of people who, re, you know, have each other's backs, you know, that gives everybody in those kind of groups a lot more of the confidence to, to speak up because uh, they know they aren't alone. Um, and it, it, it being willing to speak the, it, like at the summit coming up, like I, I, I have, I have a friend who's not going because he, he's, he's so in the doomer thing. He just thinks he'll be too much uh, difficult in it somehow. 
and uh, and I I'm planning to go and I plan to be difficult if I need to be it's like if I don't feel like they're facing the full scale of how you know overshot we are and so on uh, you know I'll speak up because if we're not facing the full you know picture of what we're facing then uh, you know we're not going to come up with things that that are going to move forward thanks Ken, did you want to check in? I'm not sure. <clears throat> um, just listening to this conversation. You know, I, a lot of things have been stirred for me. I became aware of overshoot and collapse in the early 90s when I read um, Beyond the Limits, uh, Dan, Dan Meadows and Dennis Meadows. And, you know, there's long been this idea that if we just had an external enemy that could unite us, that people would come together. And we thought, oh, COVID, you know, the plague, that'll certainly bring people together. I can't breathe. I'm not wearing a mask. You know, like it didn't work that way. I don't think the idea of an external enemy is going to unite people. So I think that's a failed strategy. Um, it doesn't seem to hold uh, the promise that people thought that it would. Um, so, you know, Gil and I hosted this call last week about how minds change. And one of the things that wasn't there that I have heard mentioned here today from, from Klaus um, is the need for a story. You know, I've long been involved in the, the world of myth and story and human development. And, and we don't have a unifying story of where humanity is going right now, except that we're going in a bad place in a bad way. That seems to be the dominant narrative. And, um, because there is a whole genre of science fiction called solar punk, which is written mostly by younger people who do see positive futures out there and they are writing about them. So, you know, I just want to, I want to make sure that doesn't get overlooked. Um, it's very, very difficult to come up with a story that is compelling cross-culturally, um, which seems to be what we're in need of right now. Like how, how can we here on OGM, um, help to create or contribute to or evoke or help us remember that, um, you know, we've been around for a really long time. The, the, the question that came up again and again in the dawn of everything is how do we get so stuck? Why are we stuck with this really stupid system? You know, we have, us humans have amazing intelligence and now we have all this AI. We can just, everything that we are struggling with is a, a cause of a human designed, human design failures right? We've designed our economic system to destroy the planet, you know, in convert oceans and mountain ranges and, and forests into money. Well, you can't eat money. You can't drink money. You can't breathe money, you know? So it's really not worth very much in the long run. Um, and it's what Daniel Schmachtenberg would call self-terminating. But that doesn't seem, the logic of that does not penetrate. That That's not sufficient for people to go, oh, I better not call Amazon and order another whatever it is I'm ordering or go to Costco and get pallets of stuff and, you know, all this consuming. And I read Amitav Ghosh's The Nutmeg's Curse, and he goes around to, you know, tiny developing places in the world, and they they want what we have. There, There's people who are out there, they're not like, yeah, you've had your chance. I want a car too. I want a, I want a subway system. I want all the stuff the North and West has. Uh, the the global north and, and and the western world has we want that here in our country with no regard for the ecological impact and this most startling thing i read recently is that between 2010 and 2020 humans used up as much of the planet as we did in the entire 20th century so as a systems thinker or someone who's been paying attention to ecology for 37 years now i'm like how much longer before it all comes crashing down you know and I heard Think Globally, Act Locally used here. I really want to put a plug in for Think Planetarily, not globally, but Act Locally. Is global is a human design conception um, that's mostly corporate. Planet involves everything from bacteria to clouds and everything in between, you know. And the, the planet is a living, self-organizing intelligence system. Global is a, is a stupid complicated not complex but complicated 
cobbled together system that destroys everything in its wake. And how do you shift out of that? How, it's, how do you start to think planetarily? I totally agree with Doug Carmichael. The nation state is not sufficient to um, uh, to the, the planetary challenges that we face. But how do you divide, design power structures that would allow a nation state to say, okay, at the level of, of climate, we need a different uh, entity capable of handling that, kind of like in the Ministry of the Future. You know, um, it's going to be the existing powers are not going to go for that. That you, I'm not giving up my power, you know. So what is the incentive that can actually move people to say, I see the wisdom in this. I will voluntarily participate. Those are the questions that I'm grappling with. Um, you know, I, I, I think story is one of the most powerful things in terms of, of changing people's minds. When I did a, uh, some of you have heard this before, I did a, a cafe for um, peace activists and business people. And there's a lot of animosity in there, a lot of, a lot of tension. And I asked people, I said, I'd just like you at your tables to share the first time that you can remember that peace was important to you. When did that thought first occur to you? And after two rounds of that, there were no longer business people and peace activists. And there were a bunch of people who were concerned with peace because they saw the humanity in each other. So what are the stories that will allow us to see the humanity in each other? And the fact that, you know, we often say, well, most everybody really just wants to have a, a calm, peaceful life. I think that's true. Most of us do, but we get divided by those who don't want that to happen. And why do we keep ceding our power to that? And how do we design a structure that can't be gamed? I don't think you can. I think systems will sooner or later be gamed by those. So that was Jefferson's genius in saying periodically, people have to reinvent themselves, reinvent their government. They're, it's going to drift into corruption and we need to put mechanisms in place that will allow them to re redesign it on the fly but those aren't being accessed right now. So that's kind of the meta challenge that we're facing, I think, from my perspective, or part of the the meta crisis that I see. You know, it's too big for anybody to get their hands around the whole thing, but that's one of the areas that I, I see as really needing some attention. Thank you for listening. Klaus, then Kevin, then David. Yeah, um, I'm sorry, I'm jumping out of the queue. And David hasn't checked in yet. Um, but briefly, the, the the one thing that I wanted to take some extension with is the idea that Buddhism is better than or uh, uh, more appropriate in, in whichever way you, you define it uh, than, than Christianity. Because when you look at New Testament thinking, uh, the, 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 the thoughts you know, that are expressed as Jesus are amazingly similar to what you find in Buddhism. Um, but when you talk with Christians, you know, particularly politically motivated Christians, they're all bouncing around in the Old Testament, you know, finding texts in the Old Testament uh, that explain you know, how a Trump could possibly be supported. But when you really get into New Testament thinking, you know the the uh, uh, the emphasis on uh, having a society that is inclusive towards poverty, uh, that is inclusive and and caring and and uh, protective, you know, for for everyone. Uh, you know, the one body concept, where you know nothing in the body is more important than the next thing. Um, is actually uh, quite inspiring, and the the idea of the servant leader, uh, the the idea of uh, leadership and 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 authority carries responsibility, um, is very uh, is very con uh, appropriate for the needs of our time, but it has been completely bastardized, uh, and and so in fact now you know I, I mean I was. Uh, Belonging to a very to a large church, EB Free, uh, uh, Evan Free Evangelical, uh, biblically based church in in Fulton for for quite a few years, um, and they brought in a new pastor who wanted to you know emphasize New Testament thinking, and and brought forth some texts that were you know quite abrasive uh, in in view of uh, you know capitalism and so on, and they fired him. You know, the, the congregation didn't want to listen to that. Uh, so so 
that's where reformation comes to mind, right? Because Martin Luther reformed the Christian the Christian thought and created a war uh, you know, that, that, that you know, lasted uh, 30 years. So the 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 uh, the there is nothing wrong with Christianity per se if you're really talking about Christianity for as long as you are truly getting into the spirit, you know, with which that uh, 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 book was conceived. Um, so yeah, I love Buddhism and and uh, I'm I'm uh, I, I think it is very. Uh, 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 very compelling, you know, in its vision. But um, the the Christianity dominates Western culture, yeah? and and if you really want to reach into, you know, Western culture, then you have to go through. You have to take this path, and it's easy. It's 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 open, right? It's uh, uh, the the tools are, are right there. Uh, they just they just have been compromised. Kevin, would it be okay if we let David check in first since he didn't have a chance to speak? Yes, sure. Thank you. I'm not in a hurry. I don't want to step on Kevin. Go ahead, uh, David, check in. Well, I just want to build on what uh, Ken was saying. And also, I think, Stacy, you were talking about it and... I do remember last time we had this whole conversation about diversity in this conversation and uh, uh, you pointed out that you were the only woman in the group and nobody asked you why more women weren't showing up. Uh, so I would like to make a point to ask you that question and give you some space to talk about it. Uh, but before I go there, just to build on what you and Ken, I think we're both saying about uh, story and opening up and not uh, censoring yourself or um, being able to talk about the things or not holding back. Um, I agree with you, Ken, that it's not, when you say story is one of the most powerful things in changing minds, some people, I, I instantly went to like Martin Luther King and like some big grand story, some big grand narrative, but then you went into uh, getting people in a small group to start to tell their own stories. And I think that's really powerful. And um, to just to build on that, my questions are about, you know, what kinds of structures uh, create the conditions for that kind of storytelling and then what kind of spaces uh, and what might happen in spaces like this or what could happen in spaces like this. Um, how do we create those conditions that help us see the humanity in each other? Um, how to uh, try and make those spaces more inviting, more inclusive, um, more welcoming to people who are different, who are not like us? Um, and what kind of questions and prompts might open doors to those deeper conversations? Because I do think if you look at the global uh, phenomenon what is disintegrating is that um, that deeper conversation and dialogue that where people I mean we have all these social networks that are very shallow but as people have deeper conversations like this and get to know each other um, I think you, you build trust even when you have political disagreement even when you might have uh, political you might be all over the place politically, but you know when people have more common ground, um, you know, and I think now we can just order door. You know, there's all this stuff that is isolating. You know, we watch Netflix. We we don't go out to the movies so much. We order DoorDash. We don't go out. We don't see people in our neighborhoods so much. Uh, but we have this kind of ability because of Zoom and other things to have this. Uh, um, this more more global, local, we're all over the place. I mean, Doug's in Malaysia. Um, you know, we we can have the this feeling of local, um, but we even though we're distributed globally, and we can get we can have those conversations that create deeper connections. And uh, 
Uh, that's all I have to say. <laughs> Thank you. Kevin? Yeah, just a pretty small thing. Uh, there was talk about uh, questioning the nation state. And I'm starting to question it. And I think city states have worked when nation states have failed. And I think it's maybe time to imagine, you know, the, the nation state won't end. It'll just stop fixing things that connect it, I think. Uh, and then things will become isolated into climate havens and stuff like that. And so it just, I'm, I'm directing my future imagination into thinking about thinking beyond the nation state. And I don't have anything uh, big about that, except that it's, it's, it's a place to, uh, to imagine. So that's all I have to say. So uh, Stacy, I invited you to, to uh, talk a little bit about uh, thoughts you might have about how this group could be better at getting diverse. I wonder if you wanna step into that or not. Well, I won't talk about how this group in particular could be better, but I will talk in general about um, what I think makes many people stay or leave just in situations. Cause I have, you know, that I think it does have to do with curiosity and how people feel that their presence is welcomed or found to be a value. Um, and I think it does tie into how we build deeper connections. I mean, you do build deeper connections when you know about people's lives and their feelings and when you actually care. Um, I think in a lot, in a lot of groups that are dominated by men, and not all groups, again, and there, you know, it's different people. There's a lot of, and in the beginning, this group was very much like that. I'm not going to lie. There was a lot of, I'm coming here to tell everybody what I'm doing. This is about me and my time to be in the spotlight. And it wasn't, it didn't feel like there was a lot of curiosity for new, about new people coming in and who they were. And it was more like, what can I get? And again, it's not just this group, but it's a lot of times people go into a group and it's what's in this group for me? What can I get out of something? And that's the way in our, in our society it is sometimes. When we meet something, somebody, it's what can this person offer me? And those kind of things usually break down eventually. Um, I try to look at it like, who would I really want to sit and have dinner with? Because when I start working with people like that, that's when the, the bonds are, are more true. Like that's when it's stronger. Um, so I guess what I'm trying to say is in some spaces, there's not enough of genuine curiosity in other group members. And that is felt. And some people are just, they're like, why am I here? So that, that's my answer. You know, that's just a big chunk of it. That's not the whole answer, but it is a chunk of it. Thank you. Thanks. I, I, just, I just want to say one more thing, just separate from that. It is really difficult. And anytime, you know, like I know, I, I realize that I am not great at giving compliments. And I realize that comes from like my childhood. I'm used to people showing me what was wrong. And I'm very good at finding what's wrong, but I look at it as a positive. I'm only trying to find what was wrong so that I can make it better. But I also recognize how it doesn't feel good when somebody makes a suggestion. I wish it felt good. I wish we could 
we could have a group setting where it feels good to say, oh, and how about if we try this? And this will make it even better. But we're not there yet. And I wish we could be. Because, I mean, it's the people that are the problem. You know, I keep hearing, it's the people, stupid. Whatever system we move to, it doesn't matter. It's the people. We're the problem. Now, Stacey, uh, I don't know if you remember last uh, week, I think it was, Ken uh, proposed this uh, framework, I, I, I like, I wish, I wonder. Yes. And like when you say you wish it felt good to point things out, I mean, that might be a really useful uh i love that idea i wrote, made a note of it last week and i think it might be useful for for this group and may and maybe it might be a way for you to uh that could get you to where you want how you want to feel when you're making comments thank you that's a good reminder i did i did pay attention to that i forgot i just want to make note of one thing which is stacy is not the only woman here she's the one who shows up most regularly but Patty also comes, Judith comes, Jesse comes. So there are at least four women who show up on a regular basis. And I'm very aware from, you know, some of my friends who are, are not white men of saying, well, it's all white men. No, let's let's make sure we do notice and recognize who comes and, and you know, acknowledge that because it is mostly men, but there are several women who show up, who show up significantly and regularly. And maybe a good conversation for that would be, if they're willing, can we engage you in, in conversation about how we can attract more women? What would make this you know easier and, and friendlier for women? Because I think that's a worthwhile conversation to have here. You know, I mean, I, I I love you guys. It's it's wonderful to hang out here. It's lots of intellectual stimulation. But I would really love to have some more um, uh, females in the room and and some more younger people and people of color. I'd like this group to reflect more what I see when I walk out on the street. At least in Oakland, not so much in Marin, because everybody in Marin looks like me. But you know, does anybody have any closing thoughts they want to add? And then we'll go to Ken for our usual closing poem. Stacey, thanks for uh, picking Kevin up the speaking. Oh. In my experience, adding diversity after the fact is always uh, a pretty lame slice. Splice, rather. I mean, splicing it in. It's just, you know, you got to nurture it, and it's, and, and it's just really hard. Um, you know, there used to be the, the World Economic Forum had, uh, for years, only 18% female. And that was also the percentage of Episcopal female bishops in the denomination my wife is in. And uh, when the bishop suddenly moved to 25%, there was power. At 18, there wasn't. And I think that's probably true at Davos, too. And so there, you know, there was a reason that they wanted to run things because they had a better relational way than the guys and stuff. And, and it's just, you know, in that case, the women organized a power move, uh, if you will, with got enough allies. And, uh, you know, this is like a, a old straight white boomer saying, I wish there were people who didn't look like me. Well, yeah, this is a boomer group with a, a few G, old Gen X. I mean, it's just mostly guys and, and a few women. And that's, it's, that's not going to change. You know, it's just... Oh, I want to go hang with the boomers who are full of themselves and talk about tech too much. I don't think so. I don't think it's going to be that attractive. I like it, but you know, we're 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 pretty passive and and self-centered. And you know, so am I. You know, or but and I think that's what this group is. There's always this imagination. It's going to be a verb. It's like no, it's pretty much a passive, passive, passive verb. I love you guys. <laughs> uh, thanks for uh, leading today, Stacey. I, I appreciate thanks, it. Stacey. Thank you. Thank you. Ken, you want to read your poem?
Sure. This is actually a uh, short story by Kirill Gabran. It's called The Wise King. Once there ruled in the distant city of Wirani, a king who was both mighty and wise, and he was feared for his might and loved for his wisdom. Now in the heart of that city was a well whose water was cool and crystalline and from which all the inhabitants drank, even the king and his courtiers, for there was no other well. One night when everyone was asleep, a witch entered the city and poured seven drops of a strange liquid into the well and said, from this hour, he who drinks this water shall become mad. The next morning, all the inhabitants, save the king and his lord chamberlain, drank from the well and became mad, even as the witch had foretold. And during that day, the people in the narrow streets and the marketplaces did not but whisper to one another, the king is mad. Our king and his lord chamberlain have lost their reason. Surely we must be ruled. We cannot be ruled by a mad king. We must dethrone him. That evening, the king ordered a golden goblet to be filled from the well, and when it was brought to him, he drank deeply and gave it to his lord chamberlain to drink. And there was great rejoicing in the distant city of Warani, because the king and its lord chamberlain had regained their reason. That was before the invention of Kool-Aid, folks. That's actually a, <laughs> a very challenging story. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Ciao. 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 Bye. Bye, all.